Um, and so I will introduce uh, Raj and then he will take it away. Uh, so Raj is a principal data scientist at snorkel.ai, uh, where his primary focus is on enabling teams to achieve success with AI. Uh, previously, he had uh, led uh, data science enablement efforts across hundreds of data scientists at Data Robot. He also is part of uh, data science teams at Caterpillar and State Farm. Uh, Raj is a, a widely recognized speaker on AI. He's published research papers, received patents in many domains, including sports analytics, uh, deep learning, and interpretability. And he received a PhD and a JD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So he's a proud alumnus of U of I. So uh, Raj, take it away. Thanks again. And, and one thing I'll note is, Raj, I think this is your third or fourth time at, um, you know, speaking to data science user group. We don't pay him. So he must like it enough that he keeps coming back. <laughs> So very appreciative of you returning uh, just to enlighten us and, and share your wisdom with us. No, yeah, no, I enjoy meetups and especially, right, the 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 data science kind of champagne one's a, a local one in my backyard since I just live over in Bloomington as well. So, and I think, you know, part of what I will talk about today can kind of mirror some of that history of um, the various kind of other talks I've done in the past um, through through that. So what I want to talk today is I'll talk a little bit about data-centric AI. For those of you not familiar, it's kind of a growing movement within kind of machine learning to think about, you know, what is the new approaches? How are we going to solve problems going forward? And then I'll spend a little bit of time on one technique inside there called programmatic labeling. Um, I got a little bit of contact information. If you want to get a hold of me, lots of ways, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, I do a little bit. I started TikTok, so you can see some silly videos there as well if you want. All right, so what I wanna to do today is I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of my personal journey. Instead of just a bunch of slides with bullet points, I thought I'd kind of put it in some stories about my journey to kind of data-centric AI development, some of the challenges in the field, and then we'll go over programmatic labeling. Um, as we're going through this, if you have questions, feel free to shout them out. I think Matt's gonna watch the chat as well. I like this to keep, kind of be interactive. I just don't wanna kind of be up here talking the whole time. So. You know, as we go along, if you have tidbits that you want to share with the audience, uh, feel free. So I want to start talk, talking about kind of my path to data-centric AI. And so I started probably about seven years ago or so. Um, I, at like as many of the time, many of the people kind of around 2015, if you wanted to learn data science, you didn't, there wasn't a master's program you could go to or anything. About the best you could do was sign up for Andrew Ng's course on Coursera, which was like a newly emerging thing. And you'd read some blog posts or maybe you did studied a little bit of mathematical theory or computer science in school. But I was kind of one of the ones at the kind of the early part of this data science movement and data and State Farm at that time decided to put together kind of a data science team. And so this was kind of where I first started out with kind of back in the time of the original Jake, um, for those of you who remember. And it was cool. They, they hired like 20 of us PhDs, like we sat around a room, like we had these walls, right? We, we'd write kind of crazy algorithms on the wall, you know, talk data science. I mean, I just learned a tremendous amount during that time. And it was so much fun, kind of just kind of nerding out on all that stuff. Now, kind of one of the problems we worked on when I was there, oh, this is, this is my favorite time. This is to give you a little bit of the zeitgeist of the time, right? This is how data science was conceived, um, you know, about eight years ago was data science was statistics on a Mac. Um, nowadays, I think, right, Macs are used so widely that, that I don't think it has the same kind of um, fun to it. But that's how we can kind of told data science. And there was a real part of it because kind of back around 2015, if you went to an enterprise and you wanted to use a Mac, they just look at you like you're crazy. Like you just use PCs. That's the enterprise standard. Like there's no reason you would use a Mac. It's a backwards technology. So, I mean, these are some of the things that have changed um, over the time. So one of the early projects I worked on, and, and I can talk about this because State Farm has since patented. If you go look at the patents, you'll see all the descriptions of how this is done. But we had this data on home sensors. So these were sensors that people had inside their houses, like whether they were camera sensors, door sensors, window sensors, like all the sensor data inside houses. And they asked the data science team, they said, hey, data science team, will you kind of analyze this and give us some insights to it? At the time, I didn't think about like, hey, why aren't they putting like the actuarial or the other statisticians on this? We were just happy to kind of have some interesting data to work with. And, you know, it was a lot of fun. And we just kind of jumped on it. 
when we started analyzing and it was like really big data, like, I mean, we could put it on a laptop, but it just like, if you tried to open this up with like pandas or something, it was impossible. I mean, we spent probably weeks just trying to figure out how we could effectively kind of munge and manipulate this data. And, you know, one of the products we ended up using was kind of data table, which is still out there as one of the fastest ways to kind of munge um, data locally on a, on a laptop is how we did it. And then along the way, we kind of, yes, we got the data. We were able to kind of run some summary statistics. I could see averages of what happened kind of on a daily basis. We also thought, hey, you know, let's write some algorithms on this. Let's do some predictions on this. And at the time, right, uh, the data science team, like many data science teams today, worked in R and Python and wrote some, wrote some code up to do that. Now, when we talked to the team, the enterprise team, about taking this and being able to productionize it. Anybody have any idea how long, you know, this is back in like 2016-ish, it would take, you know, an organization like State Farm to take code from kind of a data scientist laptop and put it into production. Anybody have any idea how many weeks that would take? Somebody somebody tell me how long they think it would take. I, I guess at least a quarter. A quarter? Any higher lowers? Sanford says two years, you got eight, <laughs> eight plus weeks. Oh, so let me tell you. So back then, State Farm has since you know changed and they've had it has a bit more of a rapid deployment. But back then, if we wanted to get it done, it would have taken over a year. And it was partly because at the time, for example, like Python wasn't seen as an enterprise language. Like if you want to do something in enterprises, there's still some enterprises like this. You have to write your code in Java. So what we'd have to do is take all the original R and Python code, basically set up an IT project where somebody's gonna go and code it that way, right? Then they're gonna have to run tests and all that. You're gonna have to double check that. And so the process takes over a year. And of course, by then, right? The data and everything has changed as well. But like, this is the constraints like people were working with like seven or eight years ago in data science where it just seemed like there was just, it was crazy to get anything done because like everything in the world was working against you to kind of build something out. So now I want to kind of go to a bit more recent times. So this was a project probably a couple of years ago I worked with. I worked with some folks at Bayer. They've since given a conference talk about it. Um, and so this is while I was at Data Robot, but we kind of met up with some folks at Bayer. And these people were subject matter experts. They were kind of what we'd consider data analysts. They were not data scientists. One of the people was good at Excel. That's, that was their capabilities. But what they did Excel was, is they had some documents that they needed to classify, literally thousands of documents, and they come in at a regular basis. And they really understood the content of the documents and how to classify that. And so they spent a lot of time going through kind of building out that training data of categorizing all of these things. And I think it was about 15 categories that it went through. And so they spent a ton of time doing that categorization. But the nice thing is, is they had tools like Amazon's S3. So, you know, before where we were like, you know, cramped on a laptop, now you had cloud storage, right? So with the ability to scale up compute, so it became much easier to work with all that larger data um, with them. And I see this all the time, you know, the cloud technologies have really kind of opened that up. But along the way, you know, at this time of, I was at Data Robot, so we used the AutoML. And with the AutoML solution, we were able to build kind of a state-of-the-art NLP model in literally hours. The, the project took probably several months, but that's mostly because we'd build a really good model and then they'd be like, oh, wait, we initially set it up to predict every category. Now we want to reconfigure it. We want to just predict two categories and then have a second model that predicts other categories. And so we, we spent a bunch of time kind of thinking about different ways to model it. But Data Robot was an early tool like this, but now pretty much every vendor, right? There's tons of open source tools out there, have some type of auto ML. And what it's really done is it's taken the emphasis away from spending time on, on tuning and building models. Pretty much anybody can do this very quickly. And especially in NLP, you look around, right? There's a million tutorials on kind of how to do this in you know, 10 lines of code to build a state-of-the-art model. And you know, the, the folks over at kind of Hugging Face have really kind of you know, taken this to full advantage and have tutorials where 
a researcher builds a state-of-the-art model, they upload it to Hugging Face, anybody in the world can start using it right away. So it's really kind of dramatically changed where just about anybody can kind of has maybe democratized kind of machine learning and given the ability for people to do that. All right. Now, kind of this is one of the examples um, one of my colleagues likes to use when he worked at a paper on Stanford, a project around radiology. This was radiologists, like I think like x-rays and tumors. And one of the things he likes to mention in that is they had a team spend a bunch of time trying to build a better model. Like once they had the data, they were like trying to tweak the model and get it better. And what they found is like in a day, they were able to build a model that was really good. And even after they spent days and weeks trying to tweak that model, it never really changed that much in performance. What really affected the performance was going back and improving the quality of the training data and spending time looking at the examples, throwing away the bad data, cleaning up the examples. That sort of work is actually what drives and improves the model quality. Now, for some people, right, you know, old timers when I worked at State Farm, this is why the actuarial department at State Farm, right, had its own separate data spaces and they kept its own data and it kept it clean is because some of these folks realized this a long time ago, that that quality of that training data really makes a big difference when you're kind of building your machine learning models. And I think this is a realization now that we see kind of across the industry because anybody can build a really good model. It makes it very easy and the infrastructure is out there for people to easily use. And so this is where I kind of, you know, pointed out, and this is where you see a lot of the development now within AI and kind of what a lot of the new kind of startups and technologies are doing is focusing on like, how can we help people improve the training data? Because that training data is the differentiator when you have all these other tools out there that kind of make life easier for people kind of doing AI within an organization. Now I wanna take a breath here and just see if any, any kind of feedback on this, is this kind of ring a bell to people or is there something that people think that I'm kind of missing in this story? One question I have is, this makes sense, this, this movement that we've seen of, of just the importance of um, the quality of training data. Do you think that's it's more important in certain application or industry verticals as opposed to others like are there some places where you know maybe the model um, maturity is not there yet and so in that space there you know training data maybe isn't as important i'm just curious if, if you've seen a trend and you know if it differs across applications and verticals yeah so i think you know I, like i think it because it's been easy to build the models and stuff really kind of where that training data kind of matters the most is more around kind of the complexity of the data that you have so if you're working with pretty simple tabular data within an organization that's already done some data quality, there probably isn't much cleaning to do. But if you're working with something that's unstructured like text or images, they're spending some time on that data quality could probably drive a big difference in kind of your modeling. Does that make okay. sense, Matt? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. okay. And right. folks, you can pipe in you know, either just speak up or you can type in a question on the chat throughout this if you, have, yeah. if you have a question. So let's talk a little bit about kind of what's hard about training data, right? Like what, what is this about training data? And just, you know, for everybody to understand, this is the, like the, the general way you would think about developing kind of AI or machine learning is you find some data in the organization, you'd prepare it, spend some time developing your AI machine learning models, and then you'd eventually deploy it. This is kind of you know, a simplified view of the overall life cycle. And if you want to, you can try to be fine grained and kind of break down the steps um, that you have there. But kind of what we see is for a lot of problems where they're stuck at is this labeling stage. Or sometimes people won't even start problems because they know that the labeling of the data will take the longest when you're trying, when your goal is to try to build out that machine learning or AI. And for some people kind of maybe doing some basic data analytics, that's great. You know, that's this left part. That's always the first part. You always get great insights for them. But for some problems, we can kind of move beyond just looking back historically at data. We want to kind of make proactive decisions, optimizations. That's where that machine learning comes in and the rest of this life cycle. So 
not every problem is going to be like this, but when you have the places for machine learning, one of the places it slows down kind of is this labeling. And I'd be curious if anybody has felt this pain, has anybody, and I will tell you the labeling doesn't even have to be machine learning. One of the things I always like to do is whenever I work with people who have the time, like PhD candidates or people working on data science projects, I like to have them go out and collect data. It's preferably like new data that you haven't collected before. Um, I think this is one, one of the great things you often get to do during a PhD. Because once you actually go out and have to collect your own data, you have a sense of like how problematic and how vague the definitions are. And you never look at the, a, the, a chart in, the, in, a, in a journal or something like that the same way, because you realize like data is very flawed and there's a lot of hidden assumptions and any of those things that come up. Um, so I'd be curious here if, if anybody else has similar experiences with like kind of labeling data or kind of building their own data sets. Yeah, Ken mentioned an example of merging 3 million records with an existing data set. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, has anybody worked on projects that have taken a long time? Oh, yes, Sanford has. Yeah, has taken a long time because of this type of stuff? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, in my experience, uh, even structured data is risky because it seems clean, you know, because, hey, it's structured. But, you know, you don't know what kind of validations were put in place on that data. You don't know where it came from. You don't know if it was converted from another system before that. So, you know, in my experience, you really, you got to question everything. Yeah, no, absolutely. And sometimes I think we do a little bit of disservice by when we teach students, we always give them these prepackaged data sets to do it. Um, and this is why I like to always have a project where they go out and kind of do it themselves, just so they get a sense of kind of what the real world is. Um, like that. Um, I have worked on a project where uh, I used a computer vision, mm -hmm. uh, like a PyTorch uh, yeah. and with, with the image libraries. Um, originally, we thought of doing like, you know, manually, like the way you're suggesting, you know, but this is only for the images and what category those images are going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I used like, you know, using the neural networks approach, I was able to get like, you know, relatively good uh, classification automatically without doing like a manually. Mm -hmm. So that saved a lot of costs for us. Yeah. You know, within images, the, the value of pre-trained networks are really great to kind of give you kind of a, a good model right away. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I use in that. Yeah. yeah. I think Andrew Ng has an example, though, where he talks similarly about images, where he used a pre-trained network and they got a decent score or like a basic score. But then he went back and took a look at the images and figured out a bunch of the images in his data weren't that great because he only had a small amount, like 100 images, not like 10,000. And then by going back and spending time kind of looking at the images, reviewing the images, cropping them, he was actually able to build a much better model than if he had spent time kind of on the model-centric development. And so, right, for those of you who aren't familiar with manual labeling, like this is like the, the process is, is sometimes you'll farm it out to somebody. This is, a, a Expensify was using kind of mechanical Turk at one point where they'd send out the receipts and write somebody, you think a computer was doing it, but the human was actually typing in the amount someplace um, for this. Right. If you're working with other complex documents, you can quickly see, like, if you're trying to kind of identify some type of label or category for medical reports, right, the subject matter expertise that takes into account can take a long time and this can slow down projects. So this is kind of the pain that we see as where kind of a lot of the low hanging fruit in machine learning has been done because the data scientists can quickly kind of work with the tabular data. This type of stuff um, has a harder time to be working with. Okay, if no one has any questions or anything else, I'm gonna jump into kind of um, how we can kind of go around um, the manual labeling with programmatic labeling. And I'm gonna talk about Snorkel and here I'm gonna talk just about the open source Snorkel. So if you Google Snorkel, you'll go and find it really quickly. And what this is, is it's an alternative to kind of manually labeling the data. And open source project widely used. If you look online, you'll see, you know, Google, Apple, you know, Intel, YouTube, like lots of major players have kind of built this stuff out because it's really the only way to kind of scale out labeling across um, large data sets. So to kind of explain it, and I'm going to explain this in a different way. I know most of my colleagues are kind of fancy kind of PhD people, and I want to kind of make it simpler and 
instead of even like using Python, we're going to kind of use Excel to explain this. So I'm, I'm hoping, uh, I'm, I'm be curious kind of if this kind of works, but what I want to explain is imagine we had to build a, build a classifier to identify is something spam or not spam, right? a kind of simple 101 machine learning um, project. Now to do this, to build this classifier, to train the, to train the computer to do this machine learning, you have to give it examples, right? This is just classic machine. It has to give examples so we can learn the pattern for it. And so somebody has to spend time kind of labeling out all this training data. And typically, like, what would you do, right? You'd, you'd sit there, you'd look at the message, right? Somebody would write down, okay, that's a, I'm looking at the message. That's a spam message, right? You'd go to the next message. What's the next message? Okay. Oh, nope. That's a real message. That's okay. Right. And you keep doing this. Oh boy, another spam message. And right. You'd keep doing this over and over and over again. Right. And right to build a good right text classifier, you might want a thousand, you know, 5,000 examples. So you're going to spend a lot of time before you get to your final data set, right. That's fully labeled that you can use. And this is what I would consider, right. Kind of the world of kind of manual labeling where, right. As you add more data, it's going to take more time. You never understand exactly why somebody did it. Like you can ask them, but you have to kind of like, why did you put that label? And sometimes they're like, oh, it was a mistake. I did it. Like it's hard to kind of get at that. And if you change your project along the way, if you decide to go, okay, well, instead of just spam, I want to classify spam in two different ways. I want to classify, I don't know, like, like financial versus, I don't know, pornographic scammer or something like that. Like, do you have to go back and relabel the data and kind of start over? So this is some of the kind of the disadvantages of kind of that kind of manual approach. And what I want to show you here now is how we can kind of skip around that with what we call programmatic labeling. Now, I want you to think about like programmatic, just like computers, if you've ever kind of coded computers or kind of watched people do algorithms, right? whenever you do this, you have to like watch the steps that somebody's done, taken. Like if somebody is labeling the spam, right? Like what are the steps that are going through their mind for labeling this message? And if we sit and we kind of talk to kind of, and this is where we often work with like subject matter experts, we'll see that, oh, they're using some heuristics. If they see these key words like investments or kind of Viagra or get rich, well, these are reasons that somebody might mark this as spam. And they might have other things than keywords that they might be looking at. They might just say, hey, you know, if the email that we get isn't already in my address book, well, that's likely to be a spam. So what I want to do is now I want to take these heuristics kind of that they have, and we're going to just convert them. And here you can think about it in terms of Excel formulas. If, if you're an Excel person, if you're a Python person, you can think about it as I'm going to write little functions. And we're going to write kind of a couple of functions here that will identify this type of material in our examples. So now let's go over. This is all of our data. And I'm going to just start by writing one simple keyword function that says, if I see that keyword, I want to mark all the examples that have that keyword as spam. So that's one labeling function. I'm going to go ahead and add some more labeling functions. I need to move you guys here. And then even add in kind of the address book. Now in the address book, it was telling us um, that it was good emails. So now I've gotten all these, what we'd call signals here from these functions about how to categorize these each individual message. At a simplest thing, what I can do is just go across this and just aggregate them with a simple majority vote, right? Like whoever has the most spams, that message is likely a spam. At the top, you can see, right? The ones here, ham. If I have a tie, like one, one is one way, one's the other way, I'm gonna just like, okay, we won't mark that message. For some of the messages, we don't have, the rules don't apply. We can't get a rule for every message, right? If we could just use two or three simple rules to do this, we would just do that. Wouldn't even worry about machine learning. But we'd go ahead and label that. And what that would give us then is we have, now we'd have some labeled data. And you can see, I just use a kind of a few pieces of code to get that labeled data. Have I lost anybody along the way here or is this tracking okay? 
Is there anybody kind of like, what the heck did I lose in? Okay. No one said anything in this the is, chat. This is making sense. Okay. So once you have the labeled data, this is where you'd use traditional machine learning, right? You use it, you have a little bit of labeled data in machine learning. The reason you put it into a model is to generalize out to the rest of the world. And that's exactly what we do here is we give it some examples of spam, then we could build a final, my final machine learning model that would be able to take any message that came in and classify that as spam or not spam. And we'll do that here. Let's pretend we kind of put it through, pick your favorite algorithm. We put it through, we get back the results. And what I wanna do here is kind of look at the results and we'll talk about how we can actually improve our model using this programmatic approach. So suppose this is the results I get. You know, Some data scientists that kind of don't use the programmatic approach might look at this and be like, oh, okay, let me improve it. I'll go find a new algorithm. I'll, I'll go change my hyperparameters, you know, that sort of thing. But I want you to think about it here in a different way. Where's most of our errors coming from? Right? The, the most of our errors are coming in this kind of box here. For those of you who are used to kind of confusion matrix is we can see where the errors are by, by the area in red. And this is where the model is predicting that it's okay, but it's actually spam, right? Like some spam is sneaking in to our model is this largest bucket of error. So let's think about how we can attack that bucket of error by finding more examples of spam. And this is where you go talk to your experts, be like, hey, how do you find spam? And they might be, well, you know what? We look for misspellings of words. That's often a good indicator. Oh, and you know what? We have a known database of good addresses. Like you should take into that. And then this is where you go work with them, say, okay, let me grab those misspellings. I can build a function that allows me to identify misspellings in words. You know, use that good list. I'm going to come back and I'm going to add that signal here where I'm going to add misspellings in good database. And then what I can do is again, aggregate those out. Now, one thing you'll see is, is we're getting pretty complicated. There's lots of colors, lots of rules here. I'm going to, in this example, use simple majority voting. But the reality is, is in a lot of problems that the way these votes are going to overlap or correlate with each other, conflict with each other. And this is where if you read the snorkel papers, a lot of the, the a lot of the theory behind snorkel is has been trying to figure out how best to kind of align all these weak signals so you get a strong signal at the end, right? A strong set of labeled data. But again, you can see we go through that same process where we're using a few of these kind of functions that gives us votes. And when we stick this through, right, we, we have newly labeled data here again, we'll put it through. What we can find out is, hey, we've actually improved the performance of the model. By teaching the training data how to handle those circumstances, the model performance has gone up. And this is like the really cool thing. And this is kind of why I joined Snorkel is like, I was like, oh, this is cool. Like it's an entirely new way to help improve our machine learning models by focusing on training data. Uh, and along the way, right, it helps kind of speed up the development as well. So if we think about it, right, this is the, the cycle we, we just went through where we kind of created these functions for labeling the data, we apply them, and then we train the model. And this is kind of the, the iterative cycle that I often talk about. And this is, often you'll see this with kind of these data-centric views is spending time iterating and improving the data is a central part of this. And I gave you a kind of a handful of things like keywords and stuff. If you read the papers, there's a lot of ideas out there for how you'd actually build all these labeling functions from simple keywords to using the latest embeddings and zero shots and you know anything you can think of that would add information, you can add a signal into these things. And so this is, you know, kind of wrapping up here. I mean, this is why, you know, this kind of programmatic approach is so compelling is when you wanna kind of go and you wanna write, kind of build out your labels, you do have a little upfront cost where you work with your subject matter experts to write these labeling functions. But the nice thing is that they scale, right? Whether it's 10 rows or whether it's a million, it scales well. And this is why, right? I think Matt and I were talking early on, like some of the folks like, uh, like the, you know, like, uh, like the kind of Google YouTubes, you know, have used this is because it scales across their wide data really well. Um, 
you know, the other piece is because the time often comes into play for when you have kind of expensive subject matter experts, if you're working with doctors or lawyers, that also plays. Um, one of the other big places we're seeing is, is there's a lot of concern nowadays about bias and data. And I, I can't remember if I gave a talk or not. I, I get lost here on bias and trust um, to the meetup. But one of the considerations often is, right, that's, that those issues about the quality of data originate from the training data. And the nice thing about programmatic labeling is I can explain exactly why every row was labeled in a particular way. It's entirely transparent. And so it adds a whole new approach towards kind of trustworthy AI where you don't have to go back and try to figure out, oh, like why did this label it some way? I mean, and for those of you who know labeling, like one of the strategies that they often have to use is because they can't trust an individual person, they often have to have like three or four people label the documents and then you have to kind of see what comes out the best um, because of there's this kind of inherent, um, what's, a, what's the word, I don't know. It's not randomness, but yeah, you just, not, not inconsistencies um, when people do it. The other approach of like this programmatic approach where now you've moved to functions and code is it's easy to reuse things because now you just have a couple of lines of code. Like you don't have to go back and restart the project. If you want to add a couple of classes, you can just reuse your work as well. So this is kind of why you see kind of programmatic taking off. You'll see, you know, tons of papers out there about it and stuff because it really gives like a new approach towards kind of doing all of this stuff. All right. So I want to kind of wrap it up and we'll kind of take some more time for questions and discussions. But I wanted for folks, you know, who maybe aren't practicing data scientists, but want to just get a sense of the industry to hopefully give you a sense of like, what are the changes that have been happening in AI? You know, why you're going to see this movement towards data centric AI and people focused much more so, although some would argue they should have always been focused on the quality of the data and improving the data as now that's really becoming the sticking point for um, AI development. And then if you're, into, if you're into this techniques, go check out Snorkel. You can go read about it online, bug me, but it's, it's a good innovative technique for kind of figuring out how to label data as well. All right. Okay, what did you guys thanks. think about that? Yeah, yeah thanks, Raj. We got a couple of questions. I'll, I'll yeah. go through those I have, and I have a couple of my own as well. So hang tight. Uh, so yeah, one thing I brought up when you were talking about the different heuristics, uh, someone mm -hmm. asked about grammatical errors and we had some discussion about just how that could induce bias, which you brought up. So I guess in general, thinking about different heuristics, you know, when the, the uh, Jeanette had brought up grammatical errors, like what is that, the mechanics of really that process of, as you're trying to do programmatic labeling of both adding new rules and taking them out? And how do mm -hmm. you actually quantify consistently like when to add in and when to add out or like take out yeah um different rules yeah so uh, like you're seeing here right like if you add a rule like is it a good rule or not a good rule right like am i adding value so typically when you're doing this and i didn't really highlight this in the presentation and maybe i should add it is you typically have some gold standard data that you're testing out these labels as you're developing them on and so that way you can see if each of these rules, even for a small portion of the data, but for a small portion of the data, is this rule actually you know, effective or ineffective? So just like traditional machine learning, you always want a little bit of held out data that you're gonna quantitatively um, measure things. And that's typically the technique that you'd use. And if you use like the Snorkel open source or kind of ours, you'll see for every labeling function that you add, you'll get back kind of um, metrics on what is the precision, right? How accurate is it within that class? What's the recall? How much of it does it affect um, as well? Does that help with kind of how you'd pick those labeling functions? And I think so. So would it be fair to say as you're optimizing your labels, you would optimize in the same way you're planning to optimize your actual ML solution? So like if you're optimizing for F1 or, you know, yeah, absolutely yep. reducing false positive, then you would want to use that same methodology when you're going through the program, program exactly. labeling methodology. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, the, one of the things you'll see is like sometimes like you can build a couple of these kind of functions and get, get a decent score, but typically this is where people will spend some time trying to add some new insights, trying to raise their score. And sometimes you might hit a plateau where, you know, you, you keep adding things and it's not doing that, but that's typically kind of what, we, what I see in the development of these. Okay, uh, question from Hugh. 
Uh, are you aware of any industries building models to analyze sound or audio data? For example, listening for diesel engine anomalies. Yeah, I mean, so when, you, when it comes to sound, right, there's some easy ones where you see, um, you know, th things like the human voice, right, where there's tons of industry doing it. But I think where you're talking about, like, for example, a diesel, that's going to be something custom, right? You're not going to buy something really off the shelf that's doing it. And typically, right, like if you, like, you know, a diesel at Caterpillar is going to sound a lot different than the Volvo diesel, right? The, the, the diesel kind of, uh, what is it, like earth, earth uh, excavator is going to be a lot different than a diesel on a Volvo engine, right? So even the sound itself is going to depend on that data. And this is where that importance of having your data that you know and training a model comes into play. So typically what you would do in that case is you'd want to use your own data to train a model. Um, now, I haven't applied the snorkel approach to kind of um, sound data, but is that kind of the problem that you have is that you only you want you want to build a custom model, but you only have a little bit of data and you need a lot more data to build that machine learning model? Yes, that's correct. That's yeah. correct. Yeah, so we haven't... So I know, I don't know if there's any papers on audio. I know there's, for example, like a, the founders of Snorkel did a bunch of papers on um, images and there's a ton of paper on images. But my guess is the similar techniques, that, you know, used for kind of images and text would work for sound. But yeah, you might be, you might be very cutting edge there because I don't know how many other people have asked for that similar kind of thing. So. Well, th thank you. Great yeah. presentation, by the way. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Uh, I have a general question and people can keep chiming in if you want or on um, the chat. Uh, so with the notion of the value of labels, which totally makes sense, how do you actually quantify the value of a label? Because if, if you think about this, programmatic labeling will also then produce label data sets. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then when you produce the label data set, you have the option of expanding it, shrinking it. Is there some way to even measure how much of an impact a certain amount of, you know, if you have 10% more labels and then even measuring the accuracy of those labels, like how that actually affects the modeling solution. Is, is there any work being done in that space? Yeah, you know, and I didn't, sometimes I show a graph and I don't, don't have a graph here. Sometimes I show kind of what I would call a learning curve that shows as you add more labels, how does that affect the model's performance, um, right? And this is like classic like, kind of machine learning 101 whenever I work with people is, Right. You kind of build out these kind of a couple of data points on your data set because that helps you understand if adding more labels is actually improving your model or if you've kind of hit a point of diminishing returns. Um, a similar thing kind of you can do with Snorkel because as you bring in the unlabeled data that you're applying this to, right, when we, when we kind of work with the spam case, like how much unlabeled data should I work with? Should I work with 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million? And it's just something that you can quantitatively measure along the way to see what works best. Now, the other part of what you're talking about is the business value. And that's always, even before you start the project, right? You wanna make sure kind of what you're working on is kind of aligned with the business and that you can measure what you're building with machine learning in terms of some type of value um, for the organization. Like the spam model is gonna be worth X dollars because it's gonna save you know this, this amount of time, for example. Well, yeah, I wondered too if, you know, Snorkel's business, um, you know, even in how they market their solutions, if, if there's this notion of, okay, we're going to save you time, but mm -hmm. also we can show by being able to programmatically create even more labels, like having twice as many labels, regardless of time, that many labels will make your solution this much better, which adds up to this many dollars. If that's part of, if, if people are starting to measure it that way more end to end. Absolutely. Right. Because you would say, right, like, you know, hand labeling, you're only going to get to 5,000. But if you use kind of the programmatic approach, you can get to 10,000. So yeah, absolutely. You could measure it that way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've just commented, anomalies can be detected using unsupervised methods, i.e. without label data. So yeah, do you want to comment just on the unsupervised methodologies, uh, you know, both for, you know, the anomaly detection use case, but even, you know, other types of scenarios yeah. that make sense. So, so you know, we, there, I think there are some papers kind of using, using Snorkel with, for example, time series data, not necessarily anomaly because with anomaly, you're kind of looking for patterns that you haven't seen before. And so most of the algorithms are looking for some type of kind of change like that. Kind of what Snorkel focuses on more is if you have a couple of anomalies that you know about, what you can do is you can use the same labeling functions idea to kind of capture the nuances of those and then 
label or identify a much larger set of data for those anomalies. So I, I, and I can't remember if on the website we have one, but there was like one telecommunications company where we kind of worked on where we were able to kind of look at all of their data, identify some of the, some of the, there's some patterns of anomalies in kind of one time series, write functions across that, and then extrapolate that out to now find these anomalies in other time periods as well. But I want to kind of emphasize, it's still kind of a supervised approach versus kind of the unsupervised magic algorithm that will find something that no one has seen before, which I'm always skeptical of nowadays. <laughs> Does that help for the kind of the, uh, the um, anomaly piece, Honest? Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? I have one question not related to programmatic labeling, so I'm waiting to see if there's other questions around the topic that was presented. Okay, then I'll ask my uh, maybe closing question. Yeah. Uh, I know you've been in the data science world uh, for a while and have had a lot of interesting experiences and exposures across industries. Uh, if you look five years down the road, what, what is a data scientist doing? I think there's a lot of speculation with the rise of auto ML and um, you know, citizen data science where everyone will be doing data science. Like, what do you think it means to be a data scientist in five to 10 years? So I will tell you, it's funny that you say that because uh, like one of the, my TikToks that I made that's like gotten one of the most views is basically like a TikTok where I talk about how I changed my title from data analyst to data scientist and now I'm making the money. Um, it was the kind of the, right, the general theme of that. And I think that really struck a nerve for people because right, it, it feels like a lot of times in a lot of organizations, it's not clear what the divisions are between the two, except one has a fancier title and gets a bigger salary um, like that. So I think you know, when we get to that data AI space, it, it, you know, it, it varies so much. I remember even when I was at Caterpillar, um, like four or five years ago, they started handing out the data science title to basically anybody because they were just like, it helps us with recruiting. It helps us land people because new graduates want a data science job. So even though they're basically kind of data analysts anywhere else, we're going to call them data scientists. Um, and so, and I, and I see this a lot of times in organizations. I mean, sometimes you can think maybe the data scientist is a person that works with algorithms, but a lot of it is the really good data scientists nowadays are also the ones that can kind of communicate these AI concepts, machine learning, work with the business to figure out a problem and get it executed as well. So like much more than just kind of understanding kind of the algorithms there as well. So, I mean, I think it's, it's gonna be kind of like a confusing mess. I mean, I see a little bit of clarity in some things where you have a data analyst maybe that isn't doing kind of algorithms and machine learning. You have a machine learning engineer now that works on productionalizing ML, right? Data engineers that work on the pipelines. So there's a few kinds of things, but I think data scientist is still kind of a super kind of generic-ish title and probably will be for a while. Um, and I think maybe you'll have other growths of other titles that will kind of have much more defined areas that would now be called data science. What do you think? Yeah, I, I'm more curious of just, you know, how, you know, you mentioned how the movement of data center AI is partly because it's getting so easy to build a model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so some people are afraid of like, well, you don't even need data scientists anymore because well, building a model can just be pushed by. And I, I don't think that's the case because you need the expertise of how do you look at a problem space and understand yeah. the data under, you know, the data element of it. And then even what type of model makes sense and how to interpret results. But it, sh it should get faster for sure. <laughs> you know, with the rise of different technologies. Yeah, no, it's definitely broadened out, but I think we've also understood the limits of it, right? That there are literally now solutions that are push button, but you know, like you said, somebody has to still frame out the problem, interpret the results and all of that. And so, yes, there's still a rule, a, a huge role for people that have taken the time to understand kind of the data science skills and been mentored and have enough experience um, to do that because yeah, you can't, it's not a push button. It's not a push button type thing. I think somebody else had raised their hand on a yeah, question. Yeah, Sanford. Yeah. So uh, first of all, I was going to say that in five years, data scientists will be spending their time labeling. You know, that's. But but I I really I really love what what Raj was saying there because, you know, I I'm going to wear my gray hair proudly for a second. 
Um, you know, over the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a, a lot of, you know, different technologies that have come up and gotten hot. And then like, you know, five years later, you know, I mean, to really put it back, you know, there was a time where web development was really hot. And if you knew HTML, you know, you were getting snapped up. So I think what Raj was saying, though, which is so appropriate and would be something that I would echo to anybody who's trying to get a career in this, knowing the technology is one thing, but being able to explain the technology to other people and find the benefit for them is the real skill. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, I would continue to say there will always be a role in any technology field for people who can bridge that gap. Um, I've made a career out of it myself. Uh, don't even don't even ask me how to program stuff, you know. But I but I can speak human and translate to IT. Uh, and I think you know that's that's an excellent point. And for anybody who's trying to get a career, I would always go back to you know you need to complement your skill set with some soft skills as well, uh, because you know just knowing a specific technology is great until technology moves on and that technology is you know is the HTML of 2030. Yeah, hundred yep. percent with you. Yep. Thanks, Andrew. Any other questions or comments before we wrap up? Well, Raj, thank you so much. We'll assume you'll be back in about a year, based on past <laughs> precedents. Build a model on that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, we'll be. Uh, uh, yeah, fully in person. Yeah, and, and folks, as I mentioned in the beginning, we, we are hoping to be in person in April. We're going to work through some logistics to make that uh, happen. So thank you. I'll have a good rest of your Friday and a great weekend.